uh, to share um, our work in this venue. Uh, this has been something that has been, um, you know, I think again, a really uh, you know, during the pandemic, um, something that's been missing um, in this, uh, you know, in this environment. And so it's really nice to have these opportunities to do this. Um, Great, so I'll just get into it. Um, th again, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. Uh, these, are my, uh, uh, rel uh, these are my disclosures. Um, the, the most relevant to this is my relationship with Nova Senta, although it won't um, uh, directly, uh, it won't directly uh, uh, um, impact any of the, 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 the data that you're gonna see. So what is my lab interested in? Well, this lab, uh, you know, we are excited about um, understanding the metabolic requirements for T cell activity, T cell fate and function. And, um, and this has been something that's always like, you know, from studying mTOR back in the old days, um, now it's about understanding how different environments might change the way that T cells see nutrients. And this is of course, no, um, of course, exemplified within the tumor microenvironment, which is a very, very metabolically distinct place. And so my lab seeks to understand how metabolic deficiencies or the presence of deleterious metabolites may impact T cell function and thus the response to immune-based therapies for cancer. And so we know that tumor cells themselves are a big driver of this, right? Which we've known since Warburg, right? That tumor cells represent major metabolic drivers and they're essentially deranged um, uh, from that perspective. And so that creates in that tumor microenvironment a very distinct metabolic landscape. And what I hope to take away from this today is that we've, a lot of people have been talking recently about how tumor cells deplete the environment. And that is totally true. It happens, you can detect it. Um, and a lot, so a lot of people talk about things like this. Oxygen is depleted, tryptophan is depleted, glucose is depleted, at least in some tumor cells, uh, or in some tumor microenvironments. But I think what I hope to share with you today that it's not just the loss of the good stuff, so to speak, but that the byproducts of that metabolism can have very, very major immunoregulatory effects. That it's not so much the loss of oxygen, it, that's important of course, but also the buildup of, of ROS. And what I'm gonna talk to you the most about today is that it's not just the depletion of glucose, but rather the buildup of lactate that, um, that is a, a major immunosuppressive uh, feature of, of, uh, of cancer. So, um, you know, this is a work that kind of summarizes a lot of, a lot of data from our group that suggests that the effector T cells, conventional T cells like CD8 T cells and, and conventional CD4s succumb to very severe metabolic defects when they enter tumor microenvironments. And we've known this now since, uh, you know, for, for a while, but this is one of the first papers from our group suggesting that CD8 T cells have a repressed ability to take up glucose when they infiltrate tumors and they lose functional mitochondria. You can see here based on their mitotracker staining or by um, electron microscopy up here in the right. And this, we, we've since found that this occurs across solid cancers in mice and in, um, and in humans. Intriguingly, in humans, the degree of metabolic insufficiency, that loss of mitochondria that, when T cells enter the tumor, is variable in the patient population. And we showed um, a couple of years ago that it actually um, is correlated to the ability of the, those T cells to respond to um, PD-1 blockade. In other words, knowing something about the mitochondria of the T cells tells you something about whether or not there's enough um, energetic capacity for those, that immune system to respond to immunotherapy. And so we've since really driven and under, tried to understand how effector T cells are altered in this environment. But it goes without saying that, um, that you know, the tumor microenvironment is not a miserable place for everyone. Some cells, you know, hypoxia, nutrient deprivation can certainly inhibit T cell function in cancer if you're looking at the conventional T cells. And then, indeed, we can model this in vitro, lack of nutrients does indeed drive immune suppression. However, not all T cells are rendered dysfunctional in cancer. And in fact, some cells thrive quite, uh, quite well in this restricted environment. And most notable among these are regulatory T cells. And, and as, um, as Sylvia mentioned, I spent my training understanding T reg cells. And so while I took a brief diversion into CD8s, the fact is my love is for these very interesting cells. So um, regulatory T cells in cancer, I feel like I'm the first speaker. I am the onus of, I have the onus of talking about all of this, a small subset of CD4 positive T cells that are marked by the expression of this transcription factor called FOXP3. And they're endowed with these potent immunosuppressive capacities and they've got like 30 mechanisms by which they suppress. But most notably, 
FOXB3 is important for their function and deletion mutations in FOXB3 can result in severe and lethal autoimmune pathologies in mice, it's called scurfy, or in humans, a disease called IPEX. Treg cell insufficiency is linked to many autoimmune disorders like type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, and so on. But as Treg cells guard against the responses to self, they are also involved in anti-cancer immune responses. And tumors recruit, they activate, and they induce the differentiation of Treg cells. And so depletion of Treg cells with genetic tricks can induce kind of these robust anti-tumor effects. And so this is, for instance, a beautiful mouse um, made by Sasha Rudensky. It's a three prime UTR uh, insertion of the diphtheria toxin receptor. Mice don't have a diphtheria toxin receptor, of course. So you can deplete Treg cells, cells wholesale using DT. And you can see this is a work from when I was back when I actually worked in the lab. Um, and you can see when we deplete Treg cells with DT, tumors will just melt away. They just completely vanish. Um, but the kind of, you know, the the, the dirty little secret of this experiment is that at this point, two thirds of the mice are now die, have now died from autoimmunity, that you can't get rid of Treg cells wholesale because you need them throughout your life to maintain homeostasis. So you can't toy with these cells. You can't just get rid of them. You have to find smarter ways to, um, to preserve their immune homeostatic uh, function while targeting their uh, function in the tumor microenvironment. So I asked, we are asking in the lab, is their metabolism one of these means to specifically target them? And so the important thing to understand about Treg cells is that they're not idle, okay? First of all, they're highly overrepresented in tumor microenvironments. This is your typical B16 melanoma. And you can see that it, um, you know, more than half of the T cells in that tumor are regulatory compared to being a very small population of those cells um, within, uh, within um, you know, the, the, the peripheral uh, lymphoid organs. But more importantly, using KI67 and BRDU staining, these, T, these cells, these Treg cells, they're not inert. They're not bystanders. In fact, most of them are in some phase of the cell cycle. You can see almost all of them are KI67 positive, and half of that, or sorry, a third of those are in, um, are in S phase, taking up, um, uh, taking up BRDU. And so we've known for a long time that in conventional T cells, their proliferation and function is intrinsically linked to their ability to consume and process glucose and other nutrients. And we've shown previously that in both mice and humans, that if we measure the metabolic activity of the tumor cell, the effector function of the infiltrating conventional T cells decreases. So CD8s produce less gamma when we take them from a very metabolically active tumor. We've shown this in many, many con contexts. But does this hold up for Treg cells? Well, it's a little bit harder to do this, right? Anybody who's worked with Treg cells knows that it's not entirely um, it's not entirely easy to do this because Treg cells you have to measure kind of indirectly. So what we have to do is purify Treg cells from tumors and then ask their ability to suppress a bystander population of cells. And so we did this using a miniaturized suppression assay that um, was developed when I was back working with Dario Vignali, and we've since moved it into a, a lot of other labs. Um, but this miniaturized suppression assay allows us to assess the suppressor capacity of small numbers of Treg cells. So what we did is we purified them from various environments, and most notably environments of, di of, of different tumors with different metabolic activity. And we, have, we picked out three here, two melanomas, B16 and clone 24, and this head and neck cancer line called MIR. And what you can see here, which we thought was really, really cool, is that if you, if you highlight, um, if you isolate Treg cells from these different environments, the more metabolically active, especially glucose metabolism, but the more glycolytic the tumor was, the more suppressive the Treg cell was, which was completely different than what we saw with conventional T cells. That in this more metabolically active tumor, the, the conventional T cells would be less active, but the Treg cells were more active. So this was super, super exciting, suggesting that Treg cells have a different relationship with glucose than conventional T cells do. And of course, we've known some of that um, already based on phenomenal work from a bunch of heavy hitters in the, um, uh, in the field like Jeff Rathmal and Elfire Fire and, and many others have, have really talked about this. Now, so what we did is we took Treg cells directly ex vivo and we activated them in the seahorse, um, a, 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 a protocol that we had published a few years ago. Um, and you can see that activation directly out of a mouse 
told us that Treg cells were com were very reticent to engage in that glycolytic metabolism, that glucose metabolism that conventional T cells are known so well for. So the CD8s here and um, uh, naive CD4s, they flux glucose um, almost immediately after you activate them with anti-CD3, but Treg cells really don't do this. They really don't like to take up um, uh, and uh, they don't really like to process glucose very well. So we thought this phenomenon suggested that the Treg cells probably don't even take up glucose very well. So we used a, um, a typical uh, glucose tracer, one called 2NVD glucose, it's green glucose, um, with a FOXB3 reporter on, uh, that used ametrine as, um, as a reporter. And you can see here very clearly is that if a cell expresses FOXB3, it really doesn't take up glucose tracers. Um, and we've tested this two, with two different glucose tracers. 2NBDG has uh, recently got some bad press, but we have another one that I'll talk about in the next slide that, um, that we were also con to confirm the phenotype. So consistent with work from other groups, Treg cells really don't like taking up glucose. So we asked the question, does any of this have to do with like the tissue that they're in? We are looking at lymph nodes and tumors, but what about the rest of the mouse? And so what we did is we utilized um, uh, a, a, a novel glucose tracer um, that has high avidity and high specificity for, uh, for the glucose transporter. It's called one amino glucose Psi 5, or we like to abbreviate it glucose Psi 5. Um, and we basically looked at the Treg cells infiltrating the tumors of and infiltrating tissues of an entire mouse, all the different tissues. And we also, that mouse was also bearing a B16 melanoma. And in some cases, we inflamed the skin of the ear with a Miquelmod. And then we pulsed all the Treg cells from all the different tissues with uh, glucose Psi 5. And I hope what you can appreciate here is that the avidity for glucose and Treg cells was very, very heterogeneous. In the thymus, they were super glycolytic, but by the time they made them to the spleen, they really weren't avid for glucose anymore. Places like the liver and muscle, they were taking it up. And even in the skin, most Treg cells took up glucose. But as the Treg cell, as the skin became inflamed in purple or tumor bearing in orange, things changed. And the Treg cells started to become uh, less um, avid to take up glucose. Now, this wasn't just driven, this is at the steady state. We also looked in autoimmune environments. This is in a 12 week old pre diabetic nod mouse that expresses the FOXP3 GFP reporter. And you can see the islet infiltrating Treg cells um, from this mouse are also extremely avid to take up glucose, which suggested taking up glucose is probably not good for Treg cells. So we wanted to address this question directly. So what we did is we took a tumor bearing FOXP3 reporter mouse, we pulsed the till with NBDG to, to detect glucose avidity. And then remember, this is a FOXP3 reporter and this is just a dye and it's just a tracer dye. So we we're actually able to sort out the Treg cells based on their metabolism and ask how they perform in a suppression assay. So that's what we did. We sorted out these cells and then co-cultured them with cell trace violet labeled conventional T cells. Here are the controls of the assay, no Treg, no stim. And remarkably, if cells took up glucose, they were less, if the Treg cells, that is, took up glucose, they were far less suppressive than cells that were less glucose avid. So this was really exciting. This told us the metabolism of the Treg cell would tell us something about its activity. Notably in this assay, NVDG high Treg cells did not die in the assay. And in fact, they had increased viability. And really intriguingly, even though they were in the suppression assay in vitro, at the end of the assay, if you repulsed them with glucose, they actually maintained their avidity for glucose. So super cool stuff, definitely suggesting that NBDG high marked something very different about these cells. So naturally we asked what defined these cells? What made them, um, uh, what made them less suppressive? So we did RNA sequencing um, on the NBDG high or low cells from the tumor or the lymph nodes of, the, of these mice. And everything suggested that being NBDG low, meaning not glucose avid, resulted in a stronger Treg cell signature. You can see they expressed more of all of the very kind of uh, a prevalent FOXB3 genes, their effector molecules, and the things that program them. And our in vitro assays, if we cultured these cells, didn't really suggest they lost their Treg cell identity, but it was really only at 72 hours. So we collaborated um, with Tim Han's group and showed that if we sorted these cells out independently and transferred them into RAG knockout mice, along with colitis inducing conventional T cells, and let that experiment go for a really long time, like seven weeks, you could see that um, if you put in the NBDG high, the glucose avid Treg cell, 
They um, failed to control colitis, which you can see here, the NBDG high Treg cells had, uh, had increased colitis, increased um, their histology score here. And if we looked at the Treg cells in that mouse, they began to lose FOXP3 expression, which suggested ultimately the NBDG high Treg cells or the glucose avid Treg cells ultimately um, succumbed to instability. Now, this was sorting out the avid or non-avid Treg cells, but what about just exposure to high levels of glucose? So, um, so again, it suggested that avid Treg cells were bad at their job, but could we drive this process? So if you just took bulk Treg cells, and Mac did this experiment um, exceptionally well, if you take these Treg cells and you condition them in either low, no, low, or high glucose concentrations for just 72 hours, and then evaluate the suppression suppressor activity at an isoglycemic um, uh, situation, we got some really interesting results. And that is that conditioning Treg cells in high glucose conditions drove a less suppressive phenotype. You can see here in the red, the Treg cells that were in 25 millimolar glucose didn't suppress at all compared to cells that um, were in low glucose or no glucose conditions. What was really, really intriguing about this assay is that the Treg cells actually survived totally well in no glucose at all in the media. So what is the preferred fuel of suppressive Treg cells? I know they already know the answer because you read the title of the talk, but that's, you know, I'm telling the story. Um, so what we did is we went back to the, uh, to the RNA-seq and looked at metabolic genes. And one of the things that was really intriguing to us is that even those cells were high for glucose uptake. They were avid for glucose. The glycolytic genes were all over the map, whether that was GLU-1 or GLU-3 or any of the genes that would process glucose. Didn't really make sense. So what we did is we looked at the genes that were upregulated in the NBDG low cells. And what we found was that those cells upregulated the terminal steps of glycolysis. The conversion of pyruvate to lactate by lactate dehydrogenase, and the monocarboxylate transporter that exports lactate into the cell, um, into the milieu. So that's LDHA and SLC16A1 or MCT1. MCT1 is a monocarboxylate transporter and it transports monocarboxylates. And it does so in a proton coupled manner, both back and forth. So it's export of lactate and import of, of monocarboxylates. And a very abundant monocarboxylate in the tumor microenvironments is lactic acid. Okay, so there's a lot of lactic acid in tumors, even in tumors that have the same amount of glucose as the, as the periphery, they still tend to accumulate high degrees of lactic acid. And what's really important to understand is that we often refer to lactic acid as a waste product. It's most certainly not. Lactate is a fuel source that's used by many tissues, and it's a primordial fuel source for all sorts of things like the Cori cycle in your liver, and also it's used by, your, um, by, by neurons in your brain. So we asked the question, well, what about, T so can lactic acid do something with Treg cells? It's been known for a very long time that lactic acid is immunosuppressive. And indeed, if you culture conventional T cells in lactic acid, they slow down. So you can see as we stepwise increase the lactic acid, the, 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 the dye dilution of conventional T cells goes basically to, 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 um, to, to nothing. They don't, they don't divide at all. But interestingly, culturing Treg cells in lactate, even Treg cells that we get from the lymph node, Actually, they completely withstand um, being in high, high levels of lactic acid. They might even thrive in those conditions. That was really, really exciting. And it also uh, gave, us, um, gave us some excitement because it meant we could use lymph node Treg cells, which we can get a lot more of than from the tumor, to do deeper profiling of, these, um, of, of, of the metabolism of these cells. And they also maintain their suppressor phenotype when you condition them in, in, in lactic acid. So we then wanted to ask some questions about what was happening to the lactate. So um, we, uh, we used isotopic flux analysis and fed uniformly labeled lactate in, a, in acidic conditions so it could get inside the cell um, to Treg cells or conventional T cells in blue. What I hope you can appreciate here is that Treg cells definitely took up uh, lactate compared to conventional T cells, that's the M plus three uh, a species here, and converted it into pyruvate. But more importantly, it entered the mitochondria as citrate and malate, and that, that indicates a turn of the TCA cycle. But really excitingly, we could actually detect Treg cells converting lactate-derived carbon into upper level glycolytic intermediates like PEP, uh, 3PG, and even uh, hexose, um, hexose uh, 
phosphohexoses like um, glucose 6-phosphate. This suggested that Treg cells weren't just burning lactate, but actually using it as a carbon source to build higher order structures that are going to be necessary for things like proliferation, because almost all of the ribose in your cells is made from glucose. And if Treg cells don't take up glucose, they're going to have to find another way to make it. And indeed, um, so that's what this is saying here. Uh, Treg cells use lactate not only to generate energy, but also to generate glycolytic intermediates. And this is a process that is very reminiscent of gluconeogenesis, um, or the generation of glucose from other carbons. And indeed, we could use a gluconeogenesis inhibitor inhibiting this molecule called PEPCK. And we could um, deplete uh, PEP from, from, uh, from the lactate-derived sources. And actually, this was really, really linked to their proliferation because if we treated tumor-bearing mice um, with a, a PEPCK inhibitor called 3MP, we were able to slow down the proliferation of those Treg cells in the tumor. So this, this thus begged the question, what is the requirement for lactate uptake um, by, uh, by Treg cells in vivo? And so to do this, um, we bred, uh, so we got uh, um, a, a flox allele of MCT1 from uh, Jeff Rothstein at Johns Hopkins, the neuroscientist who studies these lactate shuttles. And um, we bred those mice to FOXP3 creep. Now, these mice are healthy. Uh, they live for years, uh, years, you know, months and months, up to a year. And, and, and we've looked at in, 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 our, in our mouse colony with no autoimmune symptoms and normal numbers of peripheral immune cells. Um, and there's a lot of data in the paper that shows this. But most importantly, when we implant those mice with tumors, a place where there's going to be a lot of lactic acid and cells are going to be, um, and Treg cells are going to be, you know, in that environment. The mice in which the Treg cells have MCT1 deleted show this slow indolent tumor growth. If we look at the um, tumor microenvironment when the tumors are the same size down here at this, at this time point, you can see that CD8 and conventional T cells are more proliferative, so it looks like they're not being suppressed as well, and they're able to elaborate more and uh, more cytokine, and they're more polyfunctional. This tells us that when Treg cells can't take up lactate, the environment is more inflammatory and the other T cells in the environment start to behave and, and, and start to have more effector function. So what happens to the Treg cells in that environment? We started exploring their metabolism. And remember what I told you, when Treg cells enter the tumor, um, they lose uh, their capacity to take up glucose. They actually repress it. However, when they lack MCT1, they can't use lactate, so they start taking up glucose to kind of pick up the slack and meet their energetic needs. And that results in them not being able to proliferate very well. They lose their stability here as measured by um, uh, neuropillin staining, and they actually start to look like a little dysfunctional as they start to really up upregulate their PD-1 expression. More, most importantly, if we do that experiment we talked about at the beginning and we sort out MCT1 deficient Treg cells from the tumor, they lose their capacity to suppress in the in vitro suppression assay. Here's one uh, um, exemplar uh, uh, trace here, but here's the amalgamated data. And um, so what, why is lactate acid, uh, lactic acid important? Well, we know that lactate is really enriched in hypoxic regions and Treg cells tend to live in the hypoxic regions of tumors. And we can measure this by this hypoxyprobe molecule called pimenidazole. And indeed, if Treg cells cannot take up glucose, they experience less hypoxia suggesting that lactate uptake allows them to thrive in hypoxic tissue. So lactic acid metabolism, metabolism represents a supplemental metabolic pathway. It's not required, but it can help maintain Treg cell functional identity in tumors. So finally, can we, can, is this therapeutically viable? Well, there's actually a lot of MCT1 inhibitors out there, but we wanted to assess what this meant from the Treg cell perspective. So what we did is we actually bred our flox allele to an inducible Treg cell specific background, FOXP3 Cre RT2. If we delete MCT1 at the time of tumor injection, we could phenocopy the Treg cell, the total Treg cell deletion in multiple models, B16, MC38, and the mirror line. Um, but then what we could do is add tamoxifen and induce MCT1 deletion, but then also add um, other immunotherapies. And what we're able to show is that in B16, a very, uh, a very aggressive tumor that doesn't respond at all to anti-PD-1, if we block MCT1 on Treg cells and add anti-PD-1, we can get increased responses. So with that, um, I, will, uh, I will finish up. 
um, I hope today I, I convinced you um, about when we're talking about lowering metabolic barriers to anti-tumor immunity, a lot of people talk about this relationship and that there's things that we can do to bolster conventional T cells, provide them metabolic support, give them mitochondria, um, get, uh, give them access to nutrients. And we can also reprogram the tumor by targeting tumor cell metabolism or remodeling that environment to promote a better environment for um, anti-tumor uh, immunity. But the kind of, what, what I hope what I've convinced you of today is that there's these other meta suppressive metabolic relationships in which tumor cells don't just starve uh, cytotoxic T cells, but actually feed more suppressor-like uh, lineages. And that we can break that to help change the environment uh, to be more, um, to tip the balance really in favor of anti-tumor immunity. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the people that did the work. This is my, uh, my, uh, my uh, lab microenvironment. This was driven primarily by a fantastic graduate student in the lab, Mac Watson, um, as well with a lot of help from um, an MSTP student in the lab, Paolo Vignali, who really, um, the two of them really tag team this project and drove a lot of, of, of innovation. And we couldn't have done this, of course, without Jeff Rothstein and Brett Morrison, who gave us the flux alleles for MCT1, and Stacey Wendell, who helped us do it, the isotopic flux analysis. Um, with that, I'll take any questions, and thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Dolov. I thought that was great. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat, so we have um, a couple of minutes to address them. So. I see a question on whether you evaluated the difference in mitochondrial function, specifically between the low and high uh, glucose avidity cells, as well as uh, your stress. Great. Um, so the answer is yes. Actually, this whole project started with mitochondria um, and uh, really evaluating the mitochondrial phenotype of Treg cells. Um, and uh, it turns out what's very interesting is that unlike conventional T cells, T reg cells have a very unique pattern if you compare their mitochondrial activity based on membrane potential and glucose uptake, such that the majority of T reg cells in a tumor, for instance, are, have low glucose avidity and have extremely depolarized mitochondria. This is probably actually because they're taking up lactate, but um, we don't know all of it yet. But the mitochondrial phenotype of Treg cells in the tumor is unique, and we're still kind of going after it. But it actually bears a lot of resemblance to what we saw in our terminally exhausted CD8 T cells. They have a similar kind of metabolic uh, phenotype, but the but the functional consequences of that are very very different. ER stress we haven't looked at, but we but we are in the process of doing so. Um. One more question. Uh, could the sensitivity of T-Rex to glucose influence disease activity of, for instance, uh, IBD patients depending on their diet? This is a huge question and extremely important. We need to understand that these things, and at our time we thought, oh, maybe the glucose uptake is a subset, but our data really suggests the T-Rex cells can change a lot with their environment and they are far more plastic to their metabolic environment than their conventional counterparts. And then that is gonna be really important to tune their functions, not just their suppressor function, like we're talking about how oh, they inhibit anti-tumor immune responses, but their other functions like tissue repair, and recruiting um, alternative cell populations into various damaged microenvironments. So this is gonna be really, really important. I think especially in the autoimmune prone scenarios, we looked in um, colitic mice, and we also looked in type one diabetes, as well as inflamed models. There's gonna be a lot of different heterogeneity here. And I think that this is gonna be extremely important and probably the driver, right, of some of this stuff. Um, and so this is obviously a, a next step of what we're doing in this department. Um, and Another key factor, just a just a little side piece, is that this MCT1 molecule does transport lactate, but it transports a lot of other things. So lactate is the most abundant monocarboxylate, but one but a key set of things that MCT1 also transports monocarboxylate-wise are short-chain fats, things that are derived from colonic bugs like butyrate, propionate, um, succinate, acetate. These molecules, and so these fuel sources may be ways for non-immune cells or either other immune cells or other metabolic cells to talk to Treg cells and, um, and enforce their suppressor capacity. So good question. Um, okay, let's do one more before Roberta gets started. Um, how conserved is this metabolic phenotype in T-Rex from different models? And are there any deficiencies in this metabolic pathway in autoimmune patients? 
Um, great question. So we evaluated the tissues, all the tissues that we could of, um, of autoimmune, of, 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 of uh, mice that were inflamed, tumor bearing, and we had the, um, the luxury of also looking at type 1 diabetes mice, nod mice, um, that had a FOXP3 reporter on them. And we could show this as T reg cells got closer to the site of auto inflammation in type 1 diabetes, we could see this phenotype occurring. We also looked in colitic guts and we saw that T reg cells did have some of that heterogeneity that we talked about, but it was really unclear. Um, it, didn't end up, it didn't end up in the paper because we weren't really sure what was driving what, and we couldn't delineate PT regs from TT regs in that environment. So we weren't, um, we're still limited with NB, with these glucose um, uh, uh, tracers. We can't look inside the cell, so we couldn't do some of the other cool markers at the time. But um, this is something that we are improving. Um, and seeing this and seeing how it translates into humans in different disease scenarios, this is the next step of this research project. Because I guess that's a follow-up question that I was going to ask um, as to the contribution of the peripheral T-Rex versus somewhere in the gut, like it's very rich in tissue um, T-Rex uh, and what the difference. Uh, yeah, this is a huge question for us. What I will tell you is this, if you just, if you do because we're again limited to surface markers. If we do NBDG or glucose sci fi versus neuropelin, it's like black and white. You can, so it's most likely, it's not like completely, they're not completely um, mutually exclusive, but most certainly neuropelin high T reg cells tend to be glucose low. And glucose high T reg cells tend to be neuropelin low. There are obviously some, some, some differences there. And uh, I know, I think with barring having the right model systems to test these um, in loss of function experiments, we'll, we'll have to see where things go, but it's, it's a really exciting next step. Perfect. Thanks, Emil. Uh, we'll move on to Roberta now. Um, so let me introduce our uh, next speaker. So Dr. Zabazodi is an assistant professor of hemodynamics